So a third effect can be called obliquity. And this is that the Earth's rotational axis not only does it precess, but it also wobbles between extremes in a fairly regular cycle. Between 21.5 degrees and 24.5 degrees. And this occurs every roughly 41,000 years. In the current geological epoch, we happen to be right in the middle of this thing. What would you expect if we actually were at the extreme at 21.5 degrees? Well, seasonal variations would be a little more mild. You wouldn't get quite the, the swing that you currently get. If you were on the opposite end, then you would expect much harsher winters, both in the north and the south. And again, how does that play out when uh, you have a larger land mass? And, you know, if you're overdriving the climate with harsher seasons, is it possible to get more ice buildup and slip into uh, this white earth phenomenon? So this is another cycle that they take into account when they try to predict ice ages and, and read the, the tea leaves of geological time. And then the final one, which is uh, another inclin uh, interesting one, inclination. This one's a little bit less studied. We know that the Earth's rotation about the, the sun, we said, was a little bit off. Was it about seven degrees from the sun's rotational plane? But that changes over time. So you know, you'll swing several degrees up and several degrees down. And so why does that change anything if the eccentricity stays the same and, and everything else is uh, equal? Sunspots. Uh, that's, that's potentially, that tends to average out over time. Sunspots move around and we move around the sun. So that's probably a secondary effect, the uh, um, idea of non-uniform radiation about the sun. Now there are some actually some important solar cycles that uh, occur at a much smaller scale than these things that influence the, the Earth's climate. Um, but for this one, what we're actually more concerned about in inclination is that the sun, like any other large gas giant, has a very hardly noticeable but present what's called an accretion disk. So if you remember, the most dramatic example of accretion disk is like Saturn, right? It's got this stuff orbiting around it, and then over time it's sort of collected into a plane, because once you get a plane around the, uh, the equatorial plane of, of matter, it has a little bit of gravitation, will kind of pull other things in orbit closer to it. And in the most dramatic uh, example, it'll organize itself into these brilliant bands like Saturn has. And so it has a very dense and, and dramatic kind of accretion disk. Now, the other gas giant, giants, they also have accretion disks. And most of them even have rings, but they're not, just not nearly as visible. But there's some stuff along this plane, a denser concentration of stuff in uh, the, the sun's basically the planet, the solar system plane where most of the stuff mean averages orbits around. And it's very faint. It's just a bunch of dust and particles. Um, hardly, hardly need to mention it. Except for the fact that if the Earth wobbles into this accretion disk of, of stuff, then there should be a net drop in insulation. I'm not talking about the pink stuff you spray in the attic. That's a, this is insulation. It's just a fancy word that means the amount of sunlight that gets into the planet. So the, the dust concentration is very low. But remember, sunlight would have to travel through a couple 150 million miles of it. And there will be a slight drop in the amount of sunlight of vari variable. Very slight, but it could add up over time. As it stands now, if you're in an inclined orbit, 
you will only pass through this disk twice in the year, right? Kind of like the problem that we were talking about earlier, right, uh, Vivek, where if you've got the, an off and inclined orbit about a body, you'll pass through the equatorial plane twice. And we do see some, uh, uh, some anecdotal evidence of more meteorite activity whenever the Earth uh, passes into those two portions of its orbit. So we suspect it's out there, a little bit of dust that does a little bit of shading. But uh, this is less, less studied. I'm not sure we have any conclusive uh, figures for this. We just know it exists. So over time, if you uh, look and observe all the cycles of these phenomenon, there are some points where they um, constructively add, and there's some points that they destructively add. They're not perfect, but they're pretty good at predicting ice ages. And the study of all this stuff together and the cycles that they produce in climate, we call these Milankovitch cycles. Named by, after a brilliant, uh, I think he was Serbian, engineer and mathematician. So we can predict ice, ice ages. We can also predict some interglacial periods. So pay, uh, periods during and, and in between ice ages when there's sort of small scale changes. But it's not perfect. Still, we can say with some certainty that we do not expect the next ice age for the next 50,000 years. So. Put your winter coat in storage. Yeah, Nathan. Are there mascots in the sun as well? So does that change the inclination problem depending on whether the dust is denser or not? That That's a really interesting question. I have no idea. Are there mascots in the sun, uh, regions of higher or lower density? Boy, that would be really hard to, to, to test. The sun does actually get dense. Even though it's mostly made of hydrogen, there's a tremendous amount of mass and gravitation. So once you get uh, you know, past the, the first layer of atmospheric plasma, there is the potential to get pretty dense. And are there regions of higher density there? I don't know. That's a good question. I've never heard anybody talk about it, but that may not mean that they're not there. This looks like a good time for some uh, private sleuthing. You can come away and see if you come back with that answer. Are there regions of higher or low density in the sun? Any other questions? I thought this is interesting stuff. Climate is a very dynamic system. Of course, this stuff is all uh, relatively large scale, so you know, data provides any arsenal of information one way or the other for the, the whole debate that we have against uh, and for uh, climate change. But the one thing you must never do is the one thing I heard my colleague do a while ago. She proclaimed dramatically. She said, it's clear that we've violated some sort of uh, equilibrium point in our, uh, in our planet's climate. It says, oh, no, 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 no. We may be introducing plenty of changes that we shouldn't be, but there's no such thing as an equilibrium point. It's been chaos from the beginning. <laughs> Deal with it.